Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Kristen Lear. She is a bat conservationist and educator. She's also a National Geographic Explorer and AAAS If Then Ambassador, an NSF Fellow and founding member of the Nivalis Conservation Network. Kristen, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. So I think we should just talk about the elephant in the room first, which is that we are in such a strange moment in time and during this global pandemic due to COVID-19. And the story, part of the story around COVID is that it, it, it sort of emerged from bats. And you are a bat conservationist and educator. I, I, I've been fortunate to know you for several years as you have really grown and accelerated your research interests in terms of bat studies. And I would love to know, like, what are your perspectives on the world right now? Yeah, it's definitely a a crazy place right now. Um, You know, I'm working from home, finishing up my PhD, and um, it's definitely been a lot of change, Um, especially in the bat world. Like you said, with with COVID, there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of talk about bats and COVID, but um, the research is actually ongoing. There's a lot of research going into where the SARS-CoV-2 virus came from. Um, and we actually don't know right now where it came from. There's really no evidence to show that it was directly transmitted from a bat to a person. So, you know, there's there's a lot of speculation going on, but there right now is no evidence that it came directly from a bat. And so, I see. I, yeah, it's really interesting. I think because bats get such a bad rap, you know, in general, um, you know, a lot of people fear bats, a lot of people misunderstand them. It's really easy to jump to that conclusion that because some bats, um, some just a couple species that we've found so far have a related virus. Um, that means that it came from from them, but that's not true, um, at least from what we know right now. And so it's it's really important that we don't kind of jump to those conclusions without this the evidence to back that up. Um, and that, that's been a big struggle right now within the bat conservation world is trying to alleviate those fears that people have. Yes, absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, there are so many different fears that emerge in the midst of a pandemic. And from those fears come deeper societal systemic problems, honestly. You know, we see um, issues with Black Americans being more um, impacted, negatively impacted by the virus. We see um, persons with intellectual disabilities or with autism Mm -hmm. getting COVID at a higher rate. And we also saw in the early days, especially, I think, a lot of racism against Asian Americans or Chinese Americans uh, or the Chinese in general, um, because that's where the virus originated. And in some ways, I I know we're diving in in the first like two minutes (laughs) of this podcast to some serious issues, but Mm -hmm. it reminds me of some of my old graduate school research around folklore and and how the legends that we kind of uh, share and storytell around can actually be the things that reveal some of our greatest values and Mm -hmm. some of our darkest challenges too. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head right there with the stories coming out. Um, You know, it doesn't really take much for people to form these, these opinions in within anything really, not just bats. Uh, But the more you tell a story, the more you hear things that, you know, the bats are going to fly in your hair. They're going to attack you. The more you hear that, even though that's not true, it just reinforces that image in your mind. Um, And if you don't have any other experiences with the thing you're talking about, with bats, for example, then you really have nothing to counter that narrative with. And I think that's a huge part of what, you know, what we do as bat conservationists is try to try to counter those narratives and put a, a positive face to what bats actually do for us and how important they really are to the environment. I love that. So tell me when you first realized your love for bat conservation. Yeah, I was, I was really young, actually. I, I've always been drawn to the underdog. I've always (laughs) just, yeah, I've always rooted for the teams. I remember when I was a a kid and we were watching football, I would always ask, you know, who's the least popular team playing? And I would always root for them because I wanted the underdog to win. And I kind of carried that into my love of bats because bats really are an underdog. They, you know, a lot of people don't know about them. A lot of people fear them, like I said, because of these stories that we tell and and the kind of narratives we form around them. 
So growing up, I was just fascinated by them. Um, also, I loved things like spiders and snakes and, and those other, you know, creepy crawlies that a lot of people don't like. <laughs> yeah, I was just drawn to them. And so when I was, um, you know, young, I was a Girl Scout uh, growing up. I still am. But uh, we would take night hikes during uh, summer camp. And that's when I, I actually got to see the bats flying around at night and just became obsessed with learning more about them. And that's when I decided in sixth grade to build bat houses for my Girl Scout Silver Award project. Um, and that was kind of my first experience actually doing bat conservation, even at that young age. And since then, it's been a lifelong passion. How did you take that early passion and grow it into what ultimately became, you know, a National Geographic Explorer and, <laughs> and all of these incredible fellowships and the research that you've been able to conduct uh, mm -hmm. in, your, in your later professional life now? I just, I've had a lot of great opportunities um, to explore my interests. Um, when I was in college in my second summer, I was looking for an internship or some sort of job for the summer. To, um, to learn more about wildlife research. And there was a posting for a PhD student uh, field assistant position in Texas working with bats. And that, I was like, ooh, that sounds really cool. And that was kind of hearkening back to my desires to, to learn about bats. And luckily I, I got that position um, and that was what really did it for me. Uh, we would spend nights just up all night chasing bats around these pecan orchards trying to study how the bats are eating the pecan nut case bearer moth which basically is a, a really bad pest of pecan trees um and that for me really sealed the deal it was it was like a dream come true <laughs> i love that so it, it's really is it what is it exactly that you're studying so it sounds like mm -hmm forms of eat, eating habits. What, what are we learning about bats right now? Oh, there's so much. Um, so there, that's one of the great things about bat research is that there's so many different subfields that you can learn about bats from. So right now I'm working, I'm finishing my PhD with the conservation of nectar feeding bats in Mexico. Um, and these are endangered bats that pollinate agave plants which we use to make tequila. So I'm basically studying how we can work with local communities in Mexico that harvest and use agaves for many different purposes, how we can work with them to support agave restoration for bats while also still benefiting the people. Wow. Yeah, so it's been, you know, that's part of, a small part of bat research. I mean, there's there's a lot of other, a lot of research, like I said, going into COVID, going into you know, how bats can live such long lives. They, they live extraordinarily long lives without getting high rates of cancer. Um, you know, how can they do that? Can we learn from them to boost our own immune systems? There's just a lot of, a lot of cool research going on with bats. So tell us more, since, since COVID, of course, is what's on all of our minds and on our hearts. Tell us more about some of the research that's emerging you know, with, with that in particular. And, mm -hmm. and I, I love how you, you, you already referenced this, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the kind of storytelling that you're mm -hmm. having to do in order to educate and, and help people like me, for instance, who <laughs> heard a story and made an assumption, um, help us learn what's the, what's the fact versus the fiction of the science. Mm -hmm. There, that's a, a big, big thing right now, because there's so many articles, you know, in, in the popular media, you know, on, on news channels about COVID, right? There's, there's a lot going on and it's hard to know what to listen to because, you know, a lot of those media stories, they, they basically are written to, to sell, right? To sell their story um, and to get views. And so the things that tend to get views in this case are things that sensationalize the issue. Um, things that, you know, paint bats, for example, in a, a scary light. And unfortunately, combating that, is, it's really hard to un undo that once it's occurred. Um, so I think as bat conservationists, as bat biologists and researchers, what we do is we, you know, we're studying the bats themselves and, and trying to figure out what actually is going on. And then a huge part of what we do is translating that into everyday language, right? Because you can't just publish a paper in a scientific journal and call it quits. We really need to to reach out and explain what we're finding in ways that everyone can understand, um, and that's where stories come in. Uh, that's where 
connecting with people and really understanding why people have the, the views that they do and connecting with them on a personal level is so important. Um, I, I think, completely agree. I, yeah. I love that. That's, and I see that in so much of your work. So you're kind of, you, you're called the bat lady, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love how approachable and relatable you are in so much of your media presence. I think a lot of academics, um, you know, myself included, I really struggled when I was in academia as a professor to mm-hmm. articulate my research to the outside world. I mean, ultimately, I, I guess I was successful in it because I formed a mm-hmm. company around that exact mission. But I, I just sort of saw that I, I think all academics are aware of how challenging that is to explain our research to anyone in a mm-hmm. way that everyone can understand. Um, but it's so critical. It's so important that we do that. It's especially when we're working in public institutions or we're getting federal mm-hmm. grant dollars to do that research. I just really believe in the importance of making sure that those taxpayer dollars that we're spending on research at, at the university level are then translated back to those taxpayers. I, I think that it makes the world a better place, a smarter and more intelligent place. Yeah. It can make make good decisions. Mm-hmm. But I, I love that about your work. So can you share with us, you know, <laughs> what made you decide to, to call yourself the bat lady and to, to really be more public facing with your research? I think it's for a couple reasons, really. Um, one is that bats, I think, really do lend themselves to this kind of more public outreach. Um, you know, they're, they're a, like I said, often misunderstood group of animals and there's a lot of misconceptions about them. But that means there's a lot of opportunity to connect with people about them. And going back to storytelling, you know, everyone has a bat story. Yes. Everyone, you know, like, oh, my grandma had bats in her house. Or, oh, we, we saw bats at Bracken Cave come out and it was so cool. Um, you know, everyone has knows somebody or has a story about bats. And so I think that's a really great opening to, to talk with people and to connect on that personal level about the importance of bats and the importance of having them around. And so I think for me, that's one of the most exciting parts of what I do is, is the connections with people. Um, So that's part of why, you know, being bat lady and like personifying that is, is really fun for me because it's, um, it's fun, but it also, it helps with that connection. Um, Yeah. I, I, I especially admire when a younger professional, you know, (laughs) chooses to do that truly. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it, it is harder when you're a postdoc or a PhD student um, and, and there can sometimes be a power dynamic. Mm-hmm. It, it, it sort of depends on your mentor and your dissertation advisor and, and all of that. But um, there could sometimes be a dynamic where graduate students feel more shy or more nervous to put their arguments or their mm-hmm. perspectives out into the world. But I think, you know, once you're at the PhD level, you are deserving for the most part to, <laughs> to be sharing, you know, your research and and, and practice as early as you can. Mm-hmm. Absolutely practice forming the story around your research because Absolutely. that's going to help you get grant funding. It's going to help you get ultimately, you know, the research job that you're looking for and get buy-in for, for the directions that that research could take. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and that's one of the exciting things too, is that there's always room to learn more and there's always room to improve. Um, you know, I've been doing bat talks and, you know, public bat presentations for, I mean, over 11 years now, a long time. Wow. Yeah. And so like, I have this kind of set of presentations that are like my go-to and that I tweak depending on the audience. Um, but there was actually a paper that just came out a few days ago about how, um, communicating about bats and how best to do that, especially given people's biases and, and others, you know, psychological, um, yeah, biases. And it really made me think about the way I present and the way the things that I talk about. And I learned a lot from that paper um, about how I could improve my own presentations. And so I think that's one of the really fun things is that it's always changing and there's always room to learn more and do better. Tell us some of the strategies that you gleaned from that article. Oh gosh. Yeah. I was talking about like, and I might've actually done this already, but um, when you when you're talking about um, like myths about bats, for example, if you bring up the myth first before, you know, couching that as a myth um, or before countering that with something else, people will associate what you say with the myth. Like they'll, they'll think of the myth first, like, mm-hmm. you know, bats are blind. Um, and that's not, that's not true. 
Yeah, so it's really interesting and how how you say things really matters. Um, and so again, with the storytelling, it goes back to what, how the order of we do things, why we say things and and how we say it for who we're talking to. Oh yes. Oh my gosh. I we're we're such believers in that. So yeah. <laughs> I, I'm 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 thinking we, we created a training last year called Innovation Storytelling Training. And we've been delivering it to different innovation teams and research and development groups. And one of the things we talk about, it, it reminds me of that. It's called the serial position effect. Uh-huh. And it's it's the idea that as humans, we're so much more likely to remember the thing we hear first and the thing we hear last. <laughs> and you know, the stuff in the middle, we can be a, a a little more prone to forgetting. Mm-hmm. And so if you start with the myth, it makes sense that if you start with the myth and then in the middle of a story, you say, oh, that wasn't true, mm-hmm. um, that, that, can, that can cause more confusion. Absolutely. or, or might, It yeah. might cement that, that myth in their brain, even though that's what you're trying to counter. Um, yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I've done that um, in a lot of my talks. And so you know, taking those things that we're learning from other fields and applying that to your work, I think is so important. Um, and, and being adaptable to change based on all this new information is is so important. Uh Yeah, absolutely. And again, what I love about your work is you're, you're such a science storyteller, you know? And so could you tell me what, what are your perspectives on, I think we've shared it already, but I'd love Mm -hmm. just kind of directly to ask you, why does storytelling matter to science? Oh, it's, it's so important. Um, Because it gets the information out there in a way that's understandable. Um, You know, some fields aren't as problematic, I guess, from that sense. Um, You know, conservation, wildlife in general is fairly easy to understand, Mm. you know, at a basic level. People tend to be passionate about animals. Most people have a place in their heart for animals and and curiosity around that naturally. Yeah. And so that, I think, in a sense, you know, it's, I'm lucky to work with bats because they are an animal and people are drawn to animals. And also there's a lot of kind of good fodder there for stories. Like I said before, with people having their own bat stories. Um, but, you know, even other fields that might not seem as open to storytelling, like, I don't know, physics or math, mathematics, um, you know, those are still open for stories. And I think finding ways to, to make it fun and make it relatable is, is so challenging, but really one of the fun parts of the job. For sure. And I think there are ways to make data, Mm -hmm. share data in a, in a way that harkens to a story and a story doesn't always have to look like the hero's journey or, Uh um, you know, the way that we're sort of trained to, to think of it in Pixar language, (laughs) Uh, although there's a lot of power to that structure, but, um, in terms of data itself, um, just putting a lot of numbers and figures up on the board or mm-hmm. having, you know, pie charts instead of other kinds of visuals, those can really lead to people walking away, not understanding why the data mattered to mm-hmm. what you were trying to say. And the more you can provide context and the more you can think about what's the story of the data and how do I communicate that in a way that's accurate, but that still is memorable and clear to people. I think mm-hmm. when you can figure that out, it's so important. And I don't think that a lot of scientists in graduate school are really taught to think that way about their data. It's, it's it's a little bit more like the data is the data. Yeah. I mean, we're taught to tell a story in the papers, you know, in our publication, Yes, but it's a very different kind of story. You know, it's, it's not the traditional story that you think of with characters and, you know, things like that. Um, And yeah, I think it is actually becoming a lot more common for graduate students to receive science communication training. Um, it's becoming, Thank goodness. I know, really, it really is becoming <laughs> exciting. Yeah, a bigger thing. And it's, of course, not everywhere. And it's still kind of developing um, and gaining traction within universities. But um, it, it is definitely needed. Yes. Yes. Some of my favorite moments, um, I've been lucky to work in organizations or in um, universities like Purdue that are very integrated between the arts Mm -hmm. and sciences. And so there was a lot of really strong training that would go into, you know, the engineering students getting communications Uh training and that sort of thing. Um, So I feel, you know, fortunate to have seen programs that do that really well. Um, But obviously, you know, I'm, I'm so passionate about that. I I, I especially think the language of, of peer reviewed publications is a whole language (laughs) that graduate students have to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, And and funny enough, I I think it's useful for us to also unlearn it and have to describe our research in Mm -hmm 
you know, trade publications or in, in news outlets Absolutely. and with, <laughs> with everyday people, that's, that's such a bigger challenge, honestly, than even learning the whole rhetorical scene of publishing <laughs> in a peer reviewed journal. Yeah. It's very, both are difficult in their own ways, but you know, very important. <laughs> Yeah, we, we we talk a lot in in rhetoric and composition about rhetorical um, or about um, discourse communities mm-hmm. and, and how you know one community talks differently and and has a different shared language than another community and it can be really difficult I think especially in the in the sciences where there's so much knowledge to be gained to even enter the conversation and have something to say that's that's valid and valued mm-hmm. that you know it, in order to kind of not unlearn that language because it's, it's very important to ha- to be able to speak in the specificity that you need to, to gain traction in your field. Mm-hmm. But just to remember to get rid of that jargon sometimes and just keep practicing calling up your dad and saying, this is what, <laughs> this is what my research is doing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. that is, Kristen, yeah. I, I know that you're also really passionate about empowering other women to enter into STEM fields. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about your work with AAAS? Yes. So, um, I, so AAAS has a program called the If Then Ambassador Program, and it is for women in STEM fields to promote the diversity of women in STEM fields and to encourage girls to to pursue STEM as careers. Um, and for me, that's personally really meaningful because. You know, I grew up, like I said, a Girl Scout. I grew up with a lot of exposure to different STEM fields through summer camps, um, you know, through my parents having me do experiments when I was a kid. And I loved, you know, running around in nature and I'm running around outside. Um, And so to me, it's a really personally meaningful um, mission to encourage girls to become interested in STEM. And so as an ambassador, I work with girls of all ages um, to you have to spark that curiosity, to spark that interest in whatever field they're, they're interested in, um, and to bring kind of my experience in, in bat conservation as an example of how you can use your passion to develop it into a career. This is touching on a whole different layer of storytelling and story sharing mm-hmm. outside of, you know, actually communicating around our research and, and the topics that we're studying there's so much power in being able and willing to share your professional journey Mm -hmm. and to empower others by saying, Hey, when I was young, I wasn't sure if who I am fit what the identity of a scientist was Mm -hmm. in terms of the the books that I read or the people that I met. Um, And to challenge those stereotypes, kind of getting back to the very beginning of our conversation to, to really question some of those stories that we tell ourselves mm-hmm. about what we're capable of or what we're not. Yeah, that's exactly. And having, having those visible role models is, is kind of the, the whole point and the mission of this program is to, to put women, diverse women out there uh, to show really that, it, yeah, scientists can look like anything. You can have all these other interests. You know, you can have personal hobbies. You can be very diverse and, and still be a scientist. And that I think for me is, is very meaningful because growing up, you know, I, I idolized Jane Goodall, for example. She was one of my, um, yes. my, yeah, my women that I looked up to, you know, going out and studying animals, studying wildlife. And that's kind of what I wanted to be. And having her as an example kind of showed me that it is doable and it's, it's possible to do a career like that. And, you know, if I can do that and help some other girls find their passions, no matter what it is that to me, that's, that's the mission. I love that. That is, that is so beautiful. Do you have any other advice that you'd like to share with young women who are interested in innovation and science? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's never too early to get started. Um, to me that when I did my Girl Scout project in sixth grade, I was 12. Um, and, you know, I, looking back on that project, um, I have some, some, uh, some old pictures of me with the bat houses that I built, you know, with the help of my grandparents and mom and dad. And looking at those bat houses, they're really not the best type of bat houses. Um, they're, they're not built in the best way that an, an ideal <laughs> bat house should be built. But, you know, sure. I was 12 and I was, I was <laughs> learning and, you know, that, that experience really propelled me into to what I do now. And, and so, yeah, just don't be afraid to do something, even though it might not be perfect. Um, 
even if you're not sure exactly what you're doing, just, just try it. Um, I think that's, it, it really is important to just to try something. And then also reaching out to people. I think, especially nowadays with so much connection, you know, we have the internet, we have social media, which is huge. Um, there's so many opportunities to connect with people who are working in a field that you're interested in that it can't hurt to reach out to these people. Um, you know, I get emails and like Instagram messages from people, from kids or, or their parents who are interested in learning about bats and bat conservation as a career. Um, and I think it, it, reaching out to people who are doing what you want to do is a really great way to, to, to get an idea of the field and to start making those connections. So yeah, don't be afraid. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Yes. And, and from the mentor's perspective, if you're listening to this and Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to keep sharing your story and um, open up and be open to mentoring and making time for that because what we put out into the world will come back to us. So Mm -hmm. Kristen, I'm so grateful that we had some time to talk on the podcast today. I love the work that you do, the way that you translate it between your own subject matter expert circles <laughs> and the broader world and young women as well. So yeah. um, there's so much to learn from the work that you're doing. And could you tell us where we can find you online? Yes, um, I am on social media. I'm on Instagram at bats for life underscore Kristen. Um, and then Twitter bats for life. And it's F O R, awesome. not not the number four. <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> Very much. I love it. Yep. But yeah, definitely. That's you know, reach out. I love posting about bats and you know what I do as a bat conservationist. So um, definitely check check me out there and, and reach out again if if you have questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for being on the podcast. I'm so grateful to have you. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.